Positioned so close to the continent, the county of Kent is the first to welcome visitors from Europe who arrive on the cross-channel ferries or by Eurostar through the Channel Tunnel. But there have been times in our history when foreign intruders were to be feared and discouraged at all costs. And Kent had to serve as England's first line of defence, its sword and shield. There were no coastal defences when the Romans invaded and conquered Britain, and the Romans were the first to fortify the coast of Kent. The shore forts were built to defend Rome's newest province from raids by the Saxons. Through four centuries, Roman legions garrisoned this fort at Richborough as it was progressively strengthened until its stone walls stood 25 feet high. Yet as the power of Rome declined, even these defences could not protect Britain from invasions by the Saxons, Franks and Danes. Of the four Roman Kentish forts, only Richborough survives as an impressive ruin. And as a reminder of those waves of invaders and the ships that brought them to Britain, a replica Viking ship, the Hugin, stands on the cliffs close to Richborough. When the Normans invaded in 1066, they landed in the adjoining county of Sussex. But realising the strategic importance of Kent, they built some of their most massive fortifications in the county. On the Medway at Rochester, they built a castle to protect the main line of communication between London and the continent, and also to remind the local population of Norman power. Originally built of timber and replaced by a stone structure in the 12th century, the tower keep is the tallest in England. Other castles were built by Norman landowners as fortified private residences. The castle at Leeds near Maidstone is probably the best surviving example of such a stronghold and certainly the most beautiful. In the reign of Edward I, this formidable baronial fortress came into the possession of the crown and for the next three centuries it was a royal palace, much loved by eight of England's medieval queens. The original Norman fortifications, some of which can still be seen, were greatly improved and extended by Edward I who added an outer bailey enclosed by a high wall rising sheer from the water. Of all the fortifications started by the Normans, Dover Castle must rank as the most important. Although the great keep built by Henry II swept away the original Norman works. Henry II also built the inner curtain wall 
and 14 towers to protect the keep. In the next century, Hubert de Burgh, constable of Dover Castle and Earl of Kent, further strengthened the defences by building an outer curtain wall and reciting the main gate. Known ever since as the Constable's Gate, it looks much as he left it in 1220. Dover Castle could now well be described as the key and bolt of the whole kingdom. This bulwark, a gun platform and heavy cannon were added by Henry VIII when after the Reformation there was the serious danger of invasion by the Catholic kings of France and Spain. However, judging Dover Castle to be too lofty to defend the shore, Henry built new castles at sea level along the coast from Dover, at Walmer and at Deal. The castles are roughly circular in plan with a central tower or keep and the design enabled the cannon to have a wide arc of fire. Each castle was garrisoned by a captain and 34 men. Today Walmer Castle is the official residence of the Warden of the Sink Ports. However the feared invasion never came. Upner Castle on the River Medway in the north of the county was built by Henry's daughter Elizabeth I in 1560. It was to protect her warships at anchor in the Medway and its importance matched the growth of the Royal Dockyards on the opposite bank at Chatham. It was not until Upner's last days as a fortress that it was called upon for action in defence of the fleet. This was in 1667 when a Dutch squadron sailed into the Medway attacking both ships and dockyard. Although the garrison at Upner Castle replied with heavy artillery and musket fire, many English ships were destroyed. At the end of the 18th century, the old threat of invasion from France had returned. A novel type of defence was now constructed in the form of a canal, which was dug from Hythe to Rye on the landward side of Romney Marsh. It was intended to hold up the enemy if he succeeded in landing on the marsh, although at the time some doubted whether Napoleon, whose armies had crossed most of the major rivers in Europe, was likely to be held up by this glorified ditch. Even today, French cyclists competing in the international road race hardly seem to notice it. A more effective defence against Napoleon was the line of Martello Towers built to defend the more vulnerable parts of the coast. With brick walls eight feet thick, each tower would house, in some considerable discomfort, 20 to 30 soldiers and a 24-pounder gun. These reenactors of the period are parading in the largest and most impressive of the county's Napoleonic fortresses. Fort Amherst at Chatham. Built between 1756 and 1820 to protect the Royal Dockyard, like its Tudor predecessor, Upner Castle, on the opposite bank of the Medway. Fort Amherst's role, however, was to protect the Navy from attack on the landward side, 
and it was part of a continuous series of defences known as the Chatham Lines. Making use of the hill on which it is constructed, a vast network of tunnels and magazines was dug out of the chalk to provide stores and barracks for the fort under siege. Much of the work was carried out under appalling conditions by French prisoners of war. In fact, the massive defences were never put to the test, and its main role during the 19th century was to stage large-scale yearly siege operation exercises. Today it serves a similar purpose for the skirmishes of many groups of military reenactors. After Trafalgar, the French threat of invasion receded and after Waterloo ceased to exist altogether. And for nearly a hundred years, Kent could enjoy a peaceful respite as the Garden of England. The 20th century brought new enemies, new dangers. In the past, the threat had always come from the sea. Now an attack could be airborne. In the years after the Great War, large concrete dishes appeared along the Kent coast. They were giant hearing trumpets to warn of approaching enemy aircraft. Faster aircraft speeds and the invention of radar soon rendered them obsolete. Smaller concrete structures also mushroomed in the Kent countryside. Strong points to delay a possible invasion, which for the first time since Napoleon seemed more likely than ever after the little ships returned from Dunkirk and Britain stood alone. Dover Castle, the closest watchtower to France, once again fulfilled its ancient function as the linchpin of the country's defence. Anti-aircraft batteries replaced antique cannon as both town and castle became an early target of German bombers and long-range artillery. In the summer of 1940, Kent's fields and villages were the backdrop to the conflict in the skies above, as the RAF fought the Luftwaffe in the Battle of Britain.
Today those desperate and heroic weeks are remembered at Kent airfields, which were at the heart of the action. Biggin Hill on the fringe of London. Manston on the coast. At the Battle of Britain Memorial near Folkestone, the figure of a young flyer looks out across the white cliffs and the channel to a Europe of which Britain is now a part. Hopefully Kent will never again have to serve as England's sword and shield. 